Hello, our amazing listeners of Neuro Careers doing the impossible. It's your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K. And I'm excited to welcome you to the second season of our podcast, Exploring Entrepreneurial Careers in Neuroscience and Neurotechnologies. Have you ever wondered what it takes to transform brain science into groundbreaking products and services? Are you curious about the fearless visionaries who bridge the gap between neuroscience and entrepreneurship to change people's life and reshape our world? Are you ready to explore how to navigate the uncharted waters of neurotech entrepreneurship? In season two, we are diving deep into the world of entrepreneurial ventures in neuroscience and neurotechnologies. If you are looking to create an immediate impact and translate your neuroscience and neurotech ideas into innovative services that truly make a difference in the world, this season is tailor-made for you. Join us and learn from the best in the field about succeeding in the entrepreneurial journey in neuroscience and neurotechnology where innovation meets impact. We've got an incredible lineup of guests who have not only shaped their careers, but have also made a profound impact on the field. Throughout this season, we'll explore the captivating stories of visionaries who've risen to the challenge, who've turned obstacles into opportunities, and who've innovated in ways that are changing the landscape of neuro careers. So, whether you are a seasoned professional in the field, an inspiring entrepreneur, or simply curious about the intersection of science and business in this ever-evolving arena, the season promises inspiration, education, and a glimpse into the exciting future of neuro careers. I am Dr. Milena Krastenska, the founder of the Institute of Neuro Approaches, where I help people establish successful careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies through career coaching and education. So let's dive into the entrepreneurial journeys that are shaping the future of neuroscience and neurotechnologies together. Tune in now into the thrilling episode number 70. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, prepare to be inspired by today's guest, Dr. Patrick Britz, a seasoned expert in the field of neuroscience and an accomplished business leader. With over two decades of experience, Patrick has dedicated his career to advancing the understanding and application of neuroscience. As a general manager and CEO of NIRCS, Medicine Technique uh, GmbH, a global leader in neuroimaging solutions, Patrick oversees operations, strategy, and growth. His passion for building successful companies, markets, teams, and networks has driven the rapid expansion of product portfolios, customer bases, and partnerships. Join us in this episode as we explore Patrick's remarkable journey, his dedication to advancing neuroscience, and his expertise in business development, team leadership, innovation, and investor relations. Get ready for an insightful conversation that delves into the intersection of neuroscience, business, and of course, careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies. We will do our best to answer your questions and you will discover how individuals like Patrick Breeds are shaping the future of neuroscience and neurotech. Welcome, Patrick. It's a great pleasure to have you today on our podcast. And can you tell our listeners where you are joining us from, from what part of the world? But first of all, thank you so much for that introduction. I think that's the nicest introduction I ever got. <laughs> I'm currently in Berlin in my office, and I shall decorate my office. But yes, so 
in the center of Berlin, Berlin Mitte, which means center. And that's where Nyrex GmbH is located in, in kind of a beautiful, nice red brick building. But from here, from the inside, you don't see it. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, it's a nice visual. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself, uh, about the company you are leading at the moment? Because I know that you worked and led other companies as well. So uh, just a little bit about your current work. How to answer that quickly? Maybe about the company. So Nyrex is a provider solution provider to neuroscience researchers. We build solutions, that's devices, software, integration for people that do brain research. So FNS technology to the people that don't know, we shine light in two wavelengths. Uh, we measure how much light comes back um, as scattering and absorption can be estimated. And most factors stay the same, like the skull and the skin, hopefully all stays the same over the measurement. The only thing that changes is the amount of blood flow and whether the blood is oxygenated or not. And as oxygenated and non-oxygenated blood have a different absorption, say a different color, we, we can estimate how, I would say, oxygen utilization or, or how we have an estimate of brain activity. And yeah, we built those tools with you know, developed here in-house from fundamental technology to then building our prototypes. I could nearly give a tour here to the office and then here's production on the other side and then downstairs is all the customer facing here. You know, total we had you know, something like 50 people. We collaborate with some, I would say, 10 other companies, most of them also here in Berlin, but also some international to build those products. And then we collaborate with 20 distribution partners mm -hmm quite some markets where we, regions where we are active ourselves to bring our tech to neuroscience researchers, but also to some of the companies that are in technology. Yeah, so that's basically what the company is doing. And I think maybe one word about the position. I, I don't know, I don't have all the insights in the other companies in this space, but let's say from the productivity of the customers of publications, if you go on PubMed and see which systems are used, I would say Nyrex is about, Nyrex users are twice as productive as the second or whatever, or the next two combined. So and maybe we just work with the most productive people in the field. Anyways, that's the company, me. I, I, there's a long and a short story. So short story, maybe I uh, made everything in Germany be a second part of education. So second part of education, I wanted to become a scientist, but I guess we'll later talk about which factors make you change your mind on that. Then I became a scientific consultant that worked in support. And then I took a big challenge to run a company in the U.S. and build a company in the U.S. And that was very successful. And that's how I ended up uh, now running companies. It's a very short version. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And uh, now uh, I would like uh, us to go into more detail. Um, uh, let's uh, get into those first years when you started contemplating who, whom I want to be. What do I want to do in my life? When did it happen? Was it high school, middle school? When did you start thinking about your future career? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had a grand uncle, great uncle, that was a professor in chemistry. And it was kind of, yeah, I looked up and thought, I want to be a professor. I wanted to be a chemist, actually. And for a long time, that was my idea. So in Germany, there was some economic shift and the, the wall came down and chemistry wasn't so attractive anymore. So I looked around, I wasn't sure what to do, but I had a bit of a mission, making the world a better place and... I start studying engineering. Ah, I also, okay, now see, this is where I have kind of two pathways. I give you just a little bit longer one. In second grade, I was tested with an intelligent test and I failed. And I was considered not the smartest kid. So I was put on a certain track to learn a craft. And I learned landscape gardening. So I had a tendency to do something with nature. I grew up in a little village, so I really liked nature. So it felt like that was a match. But 
I also wanted to be a professor. So you see how far that is away. So eventually in Germany, you can add one and another one and another one and inch by inch get uh, to the point that you are going back to an academic career, but it's a long. So I did my detour, I learned landscape gardening, and I had this green background and I thought doing in the world something good, I would do environmental engineering. And that is where I quickly discovered that the problem is not the technology. And if you want to do something good in the world, back then I thought, I need to change humans. I need to understand humans. So I gave up after about one, um, now, let's see, two quarters of a year, half a year, I gave up on that and said, okay, you need to do something else. And then I wanted to study psychology, so I had to get back to school, get a degree, that I can study psychology. Then I studied psychology, and there I ended up, I was on the side of heart science. I want to understand the brain. And the university where I went, there was an EEG lab, and I said, that's perfect for me. So I started first term, I started working there as a student researcher or, or a student worker. He used the German word. Um, and I started first as a programmer and then as a, uh, to the analyzing data. And I analyzed EEG data and wrote little scripts and macros to analyze EEG data. And this is how I dove deeper and deeper into the world of EEG and trying to understand humans. But at one point, I understood ten, uh, understanding humans is not that easy. And science is not the one big thing. And hooray, I understand the brain, but many, many, many little building blocks that built the understanding is standing on the shoulders of giants and you, yourself just do a little step. Yeah. And then I worked my way through um, eight years as a researcher. And maybe I answered the next question already. How did I end up then in leaving academia? The group was really good in statistics and methods and so on, but we were incredibly unproductive compared to other groups. So by the time I figured the competition with a PhD out there, uh, there were people that had six, 10 papers published by the time they finished their PhD. And I had three papers written, not a single one out, and by some kit, and wasn't up for another six years of uncertainty with low odds of trying to get something. Yeah. I should have answered the question quicker. Basically, how did I end up there? Wanted to do something good, make the world a better place, figured out it's not the technology, it's the humans, and then went to understand humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I still haven't figured them out, but hey, I'm a neurotech. At least I think with F News, we are making really at the moment a big impact in making the world a better place. So in the end, it worked out. Yes, absolutely. The most important, you had that vision in front of you, that motivation, making the world a better place, yes, from the very young age. I would, my main motivation was that I was, as a little kid, seen as, oh, you know, the black sheep of the family, not the, you know, my brother, successful engineer and so on. You know, in, in, in the whole family, there were successful people and I fail if you will so i wanted to be a professor and show it to people so it wasn't at the beginning that i wanted to oh, make the world a better place it came later when i wanted to do something that it has an impact but at the beginning it was just i would say recognition recognition yeah yeah so how did it play out with your professor career that you were thinking about. So uh, as I understand, it didn't work the way you envisioned it. So how did your career develop further when you decided to make a change, not pursue another six years of uncertainty? Um, what did you do? Yeah, well, so the, the realization came towards the end of my PhD that uh, funding was difficult and if you don't have a lot of papers to show for you're not getting to amazing labs even so there was um there was a really really good researcher really uh create a systematic uh, fantastic researcher that i would have been very interested to work with uh, christoph hammond showed out yes uh, for sure um people out of his lab have a good shot at becoming a professor but i was late in the game so i would start with a minus it's not that i would have started. So while I was contemplating to follow this pathway, 
they were just the odds also in Germany. You look around how many professors were going into retirement, basically really a very, we called it internally a death list where we said, this person is retiring, that person is retiring, this person is retiring. Would you be able to make a profile and how many other people are competing for it? And that was incredible numbers. Like there's 25 people with really good CVs that are going to apply for this one professorship. So that was not a good starting point. That was the one side. And then on the other side, I said, okay, I start looking around. And before I even wrote my first application, I started things like I wrote a web blog that is still somewhere on WordPress. You could Google Patrick Britson, EGF from Rai, where I made my public profile. I think nowadays you would update your LinkedIn profile or something like that, or your research gate. But back then you made a website uh, in search engine optimization things. Anyways, so I made this website and I didn't go far because then the company reached out to me. Brain Products, actually, the distributor in Germany, MES, reached out. And I went to one interview and they instantly hired me, not for the MES, so let's say sales position, but um, they hired me as a scientific consultant. They hired me in support. And because I felt like a failed scientist, I wanted to have the scientific in my name. That was really important to me back then. And they yeah, hired me in support and called me scientific consultant. And then I started giving workshops and helping people with EEG analysis. I was eight years using their software from the other side. So quite some knowledge. And I knew the current, uh, the, the, the person that was doing the support at the time, I knew this person very well. Um, writing it so questions. So it was very natural and was a very nice starting point for me. So I was very happy there. Yeah. And I think from there, it went very quick after six months. Uh, they had the US entity that we tried to run and it was very difficult hiring somebody there. And I made it a habit to go to my boss, Alexander Swarinovsky, and always I tried to come with good news every day. No matter what happened, I tried to put it positive for the solution. So I walked in and said, hey, good news of the day. And he said, oh, yeah, probably the US. I said, hey, want to fix it? I'll go and fix it. Yeah. And three days later, he came and made me an offer that I could refuse. So I went to the US with kids and, uh, you know, family and wanted to stay there two years to fix the company and hire somebody and ended up being five years. And yeah, the company grew from one person me to, or I think another for 16 people. So it was a very successful mission. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for uh, telling all of that, because I think there are many points that are so relevant to our listeners. First of all, uh, that you were hired uh, basically on a spot when you went for the first interview, yes, with brain products. What do you think were the main contributors to their decision to hire you? What made you an attractive employee? Uh, of course, you mentioned that you had eight years of experience working with their product, so you were familiar with the system. Was there anything else you think that helped you get that position? I don't want to fall into the trap. Obviously, people can build a belief system after the fact what contributed. And I totally overprepared. As I said, I made this, I went to webinars, how to, oh, no, no, webinars. I went to workshops, how to build an online presence mm -hmm. and how to do applications. So, so I learned mm -hmm. really uh, for the interview process. And I looked in, into the psychology, I was studying psychology. So I read a couple of papers, what is known in science about how interviews go and so on. So I was prepared. I learned from their website, the name of every person kind of with, with old style learning cards. So I knew every person. So if you go and you're introduced, you're highly stressed, mm -hmm. you don't remember the names if they introduce themselves quickly. But I obviously knew every person by name and also what they were doing. So I was really, really well prepared. Um, and I was personally known to them because I was leading just the one person from their company at some conferences and talked to them. Honestly, now looking back, they would have hired me if I would have 
not have any of the website and the names and anything and so on. If you're eight years working with the software and they need somebody that knows their software, I was completely overqualified. They made, they got really lucky with me. You know, I'm not saying, sorry, you get lucky with getting me, but having an employee disqualified the, with, with all of the skills and experience, I was, I was a very good fit. So I would say if you want to have tips for the people, hey, why would you get hired? Um, I think a bit of a different answer because I just got very lucky to fit exactly on, yeah, being eight years of a customer and then switching sides. That is, that is just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. too easy. Yes, yes. And one more thing that you mentioned, they invited you for the interview, correct? They contacted you. So it means that you stood out for them, yes? From your blogs, you think, or because they already knew you personally? How did that happen that they invited you? Well, they have to give credit to, to my former boss back then because... Um, you were social, well connected, and so was the company. So the um, boss of that company, Eric Swayanovsky, was incredibly well connected in the research field. And just to give you an idea, he's the only non-academic who ever got uh, honorary membership of the German Psychophysiology Society. Uh, because he helped them all and he knew them all. So he was looking for help and he just asked her out. He basically called all his friends, saying, do you know somebody who is talkative, outgoing, nice, looking for a job, knows our stuff? So he called the people he knew. I was actively recruited without knowing it. My boss basically just told me, hey, there is an open sent them their CV. And so I was obviously very stressed to make this website and everything. And then I went to this interview and were totally overprepared. Okay, yeah. uh, I, how overprepared? Basically arrived with a um, tie and suit jacket and Alex Wanowski looked at me and said, take that off. We don't do that here. So that was clear that I was kind of nervous and they were, they didn't care about that much so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes and again very interesting part here that he recommended you because they ask for specific characteristics yes talkative knows uh, the software other characteristics and you actually was a great fit for that specific position so you already needed to exhibit all those characteristics yes for him to recommend you specifically for that role True, yep. true, true. <clears throat> so the, the, uh, people underestimate the value of network that I do, f I do find. And if we, we have that here once in a while, so now, now, now I'm on the other side and I would say I see some 400, 500 applications a year. And the applications that are coming via a network where people reach out and tell you, hey, you know somebody, I would, I call it social engineering your way to somebody. It's similar to a sale, right? If you want to work with this famous professor, you're not giving a cold call. You figure out, oh, I know somebody who published with him or works the lab. So you, you have some sort of connection and then you carefully go via a connection and get introduced or something like that. And that actually is also very powerful in, in finding a job. So if you have somebody coming to you and you talk to a customer who's a good customer of yours, who then says, hey, we have this really good ta a talented student who is looking for a job in the industry, Man, that's a very, very powerful recommendation. Obviously, it works in this tiny niche field. And I guess you have lots of listeners that want to go to, I don't know, one of the big tech companies or outside of our small field, like yeah, bank, insurance, whatever. It's maybe harder, but within this, within our field, so as if you stay in the industry, obviously having a network that introduces you somewhere, it's really a cheat code. Mm -hmm. It's not unfair, but it's definitely powerful. Uh, yes, yes. And actually, many of our listeners are asking these questions. So they're saying we're trying to contact people and ask them if uh, we have jobs. Uh, people are not replying. 
because obviously people are busy. So what would you recommend? Yes, I see already you are uh, smiling. Uh, so uh, what would be your recommendation? Um, because like you said, it looks like more of a cold call. Yes, uh, hello, here I am. Do you have a position? Does it work this way? And it looks like it's not usually working like that. What would be the approach you uh, recommend for uh, those people who are trying this uh, to get a job at the company like that? No, I feel like I'm giving away uh, some secrets of the trade of how to do good sales. Let me do one, one step back. Mm -hmm. If you look a job application, a lot of people approach a job application and I don't know why. And outside our industry, that may have some merit or value, but they treat it like a mass market product. They're not. We are in a niche market. We're very specialized. If I hear somebody who has written 150 applications in three months, I don't need to ask. I know that none of them will be successful, not in our market. If you apply to a huge company that have a standard process and you send a standard application and they just say we hire a hundred of X and a hundred of Y, that may work. If you apply to a company that has 10, 20, 100 employees, and they are going to have two times this position or so, and they're going to be very selective and have 50 applications, a standard application is nearly never ever going to make it. Somebody is reading it personally and somebody personally cares. It's not a recruiter that has to fill a quota. It's measured by how fast they fill the position. But somebody who thinks, I'm going to work with this person. Do I really like this? Does this person come to work with me, with the company? Or is this person just applying because they want to have a job? Or in, mm -hmm. in company mm -hmm. being in Berlin, we get a lot of applications that we want to work in Berlin. And I said, did you actually read what we are doing? And then, no, I, but I want to have a job in Berlin. And if there's somebody else writing you and saying, hey, I figured out what you're doing in this project and blah, blah, blah. And I have all those connections, why I want to work for you. So translating this back, writing your application, if it's not a cold call, we can talk more about that. The best tip that I can give is treat it as a grant application. Same way, make sure you're specific. Figure out word by word, line by line, what the grant is asking and make sure you match that with your work. Figure out line by line what the job ad is saying. Make sure you translate your skills into something that matches the line by line and send them an application where you're not just having adjusted the first paragraph, name of the company, and the last paragraph, name of the company. You wouldn't do that for a grant. And these similarities go on and on because the grant is, you do a lot of work where you sell your expertise to get money for the next two, three years. Same as a job ad. If you do it right and you find something that you really fit well, you go through the efforts to secure payments for yourself. You sell your, your skill set to get payments for the next three years to do something there. So I think if you go in the mindset of a grant application and you start to apply for a job where you are a good fit, and as smaller company in this type of market where the people care who they hire or deeply care, everyone cares, but here, I, I feel it's more personal, deeper, how they care, then this is a very good way of doing it. So now going back to this, let's call it old call versus social engineering. In the neuroscience field, I'm a sales guy. Um, how do I end up being a manager? I was an incredible, good sales guy. This led me to the initial success, and then I share. I absolutely always share all my ideas and my knowledge. And I, that there are people that say, I'm the only one who has this relationship. I'm the only one who can do this code. Can't promote this person because they need to be with this code or customer or whatever. And I'm always trying to teach everything I know. So yes, of course, I could be fired next day because everyone knows everything I know. There's nothing special about me. I can also be promoted. This is my secret to promotion is, you know, don't hold on, share. Um, yeah. So now your question was, uh, how do you get to build a good connection? So back to the point, sales, sales guy, how would a sales guy, um, get to a customer? There's no cold calling in the industry. There are very few and on in phases where they try to do 
uh, cold calling few companies do. Most companies work here by reputation, making their customers happy and successful and having really good support and you know, make make your customers successful. There's nothing better marketing than nature and science publication for a science company. So if you translate that back to how to approach them, uh, a company for, for I'm interested in a job, I think cold calling, sending a resume or something like that doesn't really work. So if you are at a conference where there are, they're the people that are the most communicative, the salespeople, consultants that want to be in touch, go to them, talk to them, and they still treat, you know, they, they will not rule out that you're a potential customer. So ask them, hey, how is it to work? Who do you know? Who's the right people? I'll have a chat with them. And then you can even ask them if there's a job com uh, coming out, connect with them on LinkedIn. If a job is coming out, hey, there's the job. Can I talk to you? How's this job really looking like? So if you approach people to build a connection and there is a value to them, value-added connections, they come to you with interest. People want to hire good people. People want to hire people that they like. So if you connect with one pe person out of this team and there's a job coming up and you have a good connection and you say, hey, do you have any tips? You will be surprised. They will go out of their way to help you. Yes, you don't want to call call. Sending it just in there is not the right way. You want to build a network and be friends with those people. And you want to start early on. If you are at the end of your PhD, I know this is a tough thing. So still, you didn't ask me the question, but yes, that helps. question answered. Sometimes people don't want to commit to this professorship approach. A lot of people do their PhD and think, oh, this goes good. I'm maybe doing professor. You know, I feel most of the time it is because if you say, I really want to become a professor, you're in for a very high chance of failure. And that is not like oneself. So staying easy and saying, if it happens, I'm happy to become a professor. is a good self-preservation strategy. But if you know that you may be not becoming a professor, you should run 5% of your energy or 10 where it makes synergy, where it makes sense to prepare the other side as well. If you're at a conference, yes, go to your posters and talks first. But afterwards, yeah, why not? Go quickly through the exhibition, hang out, connect to a couple of people. Particularly if you're interested, find this is a cool company. It's within my field. I could imagine that or yeah, whatever drives you. It's in a nice location. Um, I could imagine working for them. Yeah, why not? Chit chat with the people. Connect. Yeah. So uh, what, uh, from what you are saying, I see that uh, it's uh, much more advantageous to speak to people in person, not really via email. Or there are also some options to make people interested in what you do in other ways. If people are waiting for the conference that will happen or event that will happen in six months, how can they build connections during that time in between the meetings or events? A continued informed interest in a company is already getting you fairly far. If you say, write an email um, along the lines I see there's a job at, or I see your company is in Berlin. I'm interested to work in Berlin. Here's my resume. That is not going to get you far. If you write an email where you say, hey, I have studied what FNS is doing, and I find it's an amazing tech, and I read this paper and that paper and this paper, and I would be really interested in working for an FNS company, and if there's a position coming available, here's my resume. And if you have any feedback for me, things that I can improve, then I would be really grateful for some feedback. If it is a match, I should start with that. So if you're not, nothing against small animal research, it's a wonderful driver of, of our insights in science and so on. But if you are researching small animals and cells and whatnot and web physiology and then you can write a long email very personal very interesting it's not getting your connections to something that you that far removed but if you have some some connection and you follow them the newsletter the linkedin so on and so forth by the way people do if you send an application we have hr people those hr people gonna check through the list 
And then if you have a conversation and you can open this conversation with, hey, I know this, this, and this about the company, or I read your latest news that I find this interesting or that interesting. This is already, I would say, better than 60, 70% of the people that are actually making it that far. So long story short is, I think the key word here is proximity. If you can find, if there is no proximity, you may don't want to apply there anyways, right? And if you have this proximity and then build on it. Yes. And speaking about the proximity, uh, what uh, is the percentage of the match that you would expect uh, a potential applicant to have? Uh, many of the uh, people who are interested in joining uh, companies, they get discouraged when they look at the application requirements and they say, no, I, I still don't have this. And uh, it discourages them from applying. Um, mm. uh, however, I think uh, there are cases, uh, you know, there are no cases when there is 100% absolute match or there are cases which are very, very rare. Yes, um, I, I, probably there is a room, but what is that room that people still can hope to uh, to get into the company, uh, yes, um, well, not having all the skills, not meeting all the requirements. That's a good question, and it has to be answered carefully here. This is, here's, here's one consideration. Um, what will get through the most likely, I have five books on my table, on my desk, and that's one of them. When cultures collide, Richard D. Lewis, leading across cultures. Okay, we will put it into our podcast notes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes people feel like, um, yeah, Western culture is all similar as well. It's not. And then if you see that application coming from different cultures, it gets even wider. What people think it's a match, not a match. Um, I think. The most liberal perspective on what's a match or not is, I would say something like an, so from my experience, I have a wonderful colleague from India working and if I get his feedback, I, it's all a match. You get application where you stay, you have to have, it's a firm requirement, you have to have a background of the and you get applications from, let's say you say, we need somebody who is a psychologist. You get somebody who did engineering and you get somebody who did math and whatnot. And they say, yeah, I had a course or something like that. So a very open interpretation. And, but, but in all honesty, it's then hardly a match. And a good written job ad actually gives you some point of what are really fixed criterions and what are not. And then you can look at those criterions, how they, if that is something, you know, if they say we want to have three years of experience and you have two and a half. That's close enough. If they say we need somebody with a PhD and you have a master's and something that you think is equivalent to a PhD, let's say three year work in the field, that's close enough. If they're looking for a different discipline, let's say if you are in a in something where it's very hard, if you if you let's say the one thing that I see frequently is I have worked on cells and hormones and something and they're looking for somebody that looks on mri images while you both worked on neuroscience you went to the same sfn conference you wouldn't have talked at that conference together you would have talked about the weather or the location of the food it's very hard to connect anything and there are connections yes i know but not to the extent that somebody would consider it as a valuable background so i think to answer your question more succinctly Read what they really put as core criteria if they say you must have and that you should match, I would say, to 30% or something. If it's really not a match, one of those criteria, I wouldn't. If it is something like on a scale, levels, experience, languages, I would be very liberal, particularly if other things are a good fit. But again, I would think from a starting point, I would write fewer applications, but write them better, which would lead to you anyway, supplying to more positions where you are actually a good fit. 
Very big companies, I think, are also different. In a very big company, they have basically a scheme and a fixed process and a recruiter that goes by some sort of scheme. I think there you can just change the name and apply. And the smaller the company gets, the more it matters to really target and, and write a specific for them. Or you also use smaller, the smaller the market is, the more specific the role is. If they're looking for the 20th logistics person, it's very different if they're looking to, to hire the first scientist. Yes. And in, in regards to that, uh, for example, if a person says, yes, I'm still liking certain things, let's say they have experience in EEG data analysis, but they don't have much experience in uh, EEG acquisition, and this is something that the company requires. What are the best ways to overcome uh, this uh, lack of experience to eventually get hired by the company? If the person is really set their eye on this company, they love everything about it and they want to be hired. For example, is it enough to learn about this theoretically? Yes, what are artifacts, what's what's going on to take a course, or maybe there are some other ways, uh, getting internships. So what would you recommend to a person in this situation where there is something that is missing that is very important for the job, uh, and the person is willing to go above and beyond to get to that place? The two answers to it. If they put in the profile that they want to have somebody with hands on experience, uh, they, they, they would write something like, we want somebody with EEG experience from setting up equipment, hands-on recording, data analysis, statistics, and publishing. Basically, they would write something like this. And then you would look at a job. Usually, uh, that would be then a job like yeah, a scientific consultant or some research fellow or whatever. If this person doesn't bring the hands-on expertise it wouldn't be too bad because even if they have hands-on expertise with system one and at your lab or the company, they will have system two, then you have to relearn it anyways. And if you're really good at data analysis, you look at the data and you say, well, there, we have a problem with our recording and you can go back and learning that search. I think in this case, I would ignore basically this knowledge and would say, oh, I'll build it up and say, okay, which system you are looking at? And I read up on the system and... Worst case scenario, of course. It's very different if they would say we are looking for a lab technician to run our thousand subject clinical study, and we want to have somebody that has three years hand on hands on recording, because you learn other things. You learn to manage patients and set them up and keep them entertained or report from difficult population, kids, whatever, and ensure under challenging conditions to always get reliable good data. And in this case, I would say you can't quickly learn it. anything that you have learned over three, five years is, is a skill set. And you cannot just mimic that by reading a book. So if the skill set is really central or fundamental to the position, then I would say, okay, I respect that. I make the link that I'm not a lab technician and that's what they're looking for. If it is in a summary where they say we need somebody who has a... Then it's a checkbox. And you would say, yeah, I, I haven't recorded with system one, but I have, I, I go out and learn system one. So that, not a biggie, right? And how to build this expertise? You said, uh, can I work in a lab? I mean, in the research field, this anyways, uh, it's nice if you get hands-on experience with several parts of the job. I find this actually with a specialization is, so on the one hand, it's good. The more you specialize, the deeper you get. But I do find people, let's say computational neuroscience, Bernstein Network in Germany, really well-trained people, really smart people. But sometimes you encounter people that have worked on data, sometimes specifically pre-processed data and optimized one algorithm. And they've really never done any recording. They don't know where the data come from. And actually it helps them a lot if they have seen what the data are, what the challenges are, what what is getting into their algorithm. Then they, they know when to not try to optimize your algorithm anymore, but <laughs> you back and tell the people in the lab to record better data. Everything gets easier with good data and you should know how good data look like. So don't just be a computational person if you can. Not everyone has the opportunity. 
Yeah. In one of your interviews, I listened and I really liked what you were talking about, about uh, inquiring about the job opportunities at the companies before they even post uh, a job. Uh, can you comment a little bit more on that? Because it seems to be something new for uh, people, for job applicants. They don't think about it. They're just looking if there is uh, any already job description and uh, job announcement, and then they are applying. When they don't see, they say, oh, no, they're not hiring. Probably they don't have any places, and they're waiting for this new job to come. Uh, so uh, what, what would you tell to people uh, like this? First is the dynamic that, uh, you know, let, let's be honest. There's a certain dynamic that we know of, and we, we can take it as a fact in from LinkedIn, for LinkedIn has, uh, for every company, it has kind of a number that how many months or years people stay on average with the company. And you can also find that for a region, how long is the average tenure in Berlin? And I think it's at the moment, something like 18 months or so. Mm. And, and I wanted to say now it's, uh, it got lucky so that people stay uh, significantly longer with us. But if I look at LinkedIn, our number is still low because we have interns. So if you have an intern, even so they are by definition only staying three months, they put that on their LinkedIn, then LinkedIn says, well, you had somebody who left you for three months, so your number looks somewhat lower. So let's say the number is realistically 24 months. That means 50% of people, 12 months is half, right? You have a turnover of 50% of the people. So if you have a 50 people company, 25 positions would be re refilled. That there is a lot of turnover in the market. Um, maybe I would say three years ago, people were looking for opportunity, lots of startups around here. And now people try to get out of startups and look for stability. But the fact is, oh, and then there's the platforms like uh, Stepstone and Glad and whatnot. They, they live off people trying to change their jobs. So they motivate people highly to change their job. So there's a constant fluctuation. What I'm saying is 30 years ago in Germany, there were people that basically stayed, stuck with one company for their life. This is absolute rare exception now where people are moving. Why am I saying that in so much detail? Be aware that jobs become available all the time, even if it's not on the website. And any good company will not pass on a very good candidate if this is not a role where they only need one. But if you have a role like whatever we see, you have 10 people in whatever production or so on, or in consulting. And you have a really wonderful consultant approaching you and say, hey, I will be finished with my studies in six months. I am interested. Mm. Then you, you start looking into it and saying, yeah, six months from now, very likely that we either grow to the extent that we need one more, or who knows, we may have a turnover because I mean, it doesn't mean that somebody's unhappy. Sometimes people, all walks of life, or want to move to a different country or anything happens. So a company will be open to arrange themselves with a good candidate. So first of all, job positions happen all the time. Second, good companies will not pass on a good candidate. Third, you have much better chances of getting hired if you are value added, proactive approaching this company with, hey, I went to your workshop and I listened to your newsletter or heard you on the podcast. I think it's a really interesting company. I would be interested in a position like X, Y, and Z. This is the things I'm interested in. Could you please keep my profile on file if something comes up? And then if you see a position, hey, I have applied for that would be something I'm interested in. Or could I get some feedback? Or you find them at the next conference and you have a chat with the people and say, actually, really love your tech. Um, how is it working at this company? Do you have any tips? How would I learn about jobs? Talk to those people. People in our field, right? Uh, nearly all people in our field are generally happy to help. I mean, your experience, you reach out to random people and it's not random, you know, to select people in this field and ask them, hey, would you come to a podcast so we can help some people? And what do they answer? They all answer, yeah. They all answer, yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, most of the people, yes, yeah, absolutely. But 90%. It's a yeah. really nice field. It's a lot of really nice people. It's a really nice industry. Very small industry. If you would be nasty, you wouldn't be successful. So it is a nice industry and you should know that. So you can go to those people and talk about them. And they're usually nice people that are happy to help. Yeah, yeah. And I really like this approach to actually start contacting uh, the company in advance uh, when they're still finishing their PhD. They know that maybe next year or in half a year they will be ready to uh, to start their job, um, to ask about it and ask about feedback, Some, something that you noted, mentioned several times today, because they can still, they have time to prepare to be a, a really very good match for the position. So if they ask, okay, can you provide me feedback on my current experience? Here is my resume uh, so that I really would be a good match for you and to prepare to, to do a great work at your company. What can I do uh, during this time? OHBM, OHBM mentorship program. There are opportunities where you can find mentors um, and uh, scaling the idea of asking for help up. You will be surprised there's easier or more successful than you think to find some of those mentorship events and find a mentor. Um, by the way, it goes both ways. I have a mentor, I have mentees, and they're just people that you help. It's just something what happens in this industry and people are not aware enough of find. You, what it takes is go out there, be nice to them, and you can tap in their knowledge. A couple of hours, free expert help. That's easy to achieve out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, the next uh, question is about the transition from uh, academia to industry, which you had yourself. Yes, yeah, so you transition from your PhD, um, uh, finishing it, and then going into industry. What was the most challenging part for you in this transition? Oh, I, I could give a funny answer and real answer, but um, you said finishing a PhD. Uh, that's actually the most uh, challenging thing for me. It was because I had something like three months work, or two months work, or just oh yeah, the papers were written. You have to write an entry chapter and you have to write a summary discussion of that and make a book out of it and hand it in. And then you start in the industry and things go up, 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 and then you get promoted and you go to the US and you get promoted again and business is exploring. And I always have in the back of my mind, I have to finish that PhD, I have to finish that PhD. And every paper that comes out, you think, oh, this could be the paper that's now killing my thesis and so it's a very nervous time but it took me a long time to then finally get to it and it was then after three years on the site uh, after three years finishing then your phd on the site that was a really bad experience so you were both finishing and working i didn't realize that yeah so you were doing it at the same time so i yes. kind of did my phd in three years but the official finalization was something like four years after I left uh, academia because I just hadn't finished it. And that is something I cannot recommend. Um, that was pretty brutal to finish it. Any, anyways, the real the emotional challenging part was because I was committed to becoming a scientist for a long time. And I had to admit to myself that I failed and that I didn't achieve the scientist. So that stung. Mm -hmm. um, and that stuck fully with me, uh, seeing the people that went on to become professors, uh, that stuck on the, on, on the path to become professors. Um, that, yeah, let's, let's be honest. I, 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 I felt I didn't achieve what I set out to achieve. That. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say there's no shame in admitting, but I felt shame in not having succeeded there. And it took me something like, I would say after six months working in support, I knew I had acquired a new skill. I knew that I knew EEG better than anyone else. And then six months later, it was so one year into the job, 
I was in the US and I was giving a workshop and I had PIs at the most prestigious institutes basically skipping class to come to my workshop and to learn from me how to analyze EEG. I had an enormous powerful tool. Right? Sorry to say that. How every competitor, please don't listen. But analyzer was just this EEG analysis software was the most awesome software around. And I was giving the workshops with that. So I was obviously shining full force with that thing. There was a colleague, um, uh, Marie Kutberlet, who wrote a lot of code for that. And I shared those code pieces with me. So I had lots of powerful tools and I could go in a lab and show them within in half an hour, basically analyze the experiments and show them all the uh, magic inside the data. And I suddenly was, you know, I went from, as a PhD, you become one of the most knowledgeable people on a subject. And then I went to industry and I was not the most knowledgeable subject. And then in industry, I built that back up again. And there I was, and I was the expert. And this is when I make my inner peace. And mm. Yeah. Nowadays, I love every of my customers. And being a professor is a really nice thing. But I, um, as you can tell, I'm happy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So from what you said, uh, I understand that for you, becoming the real expert became the most important Yes, uh, so this, in a way, substituted that feeling of failing, just in quotes, yes, in your professorship goals. Why I am asking, uh, because we have actually people who are contacting us as well with these questions when, for some reason, people didn't end up in academia, didn't end up in their pathway into professorship. So you sharing this, I think, can help those people to really start finding their way and their strengths at the place where they are now. That's why I'm trying to understand as much as possible what happened and how did you overcome that inner pain, yes, that not, not becoming a professor. Yeah, I would say no, no quotes needed back then. Mm -hmm. I set out with all my will to become, to understand the brain, to make the world a better place and to become a professor and contribute to that. And at one point it was clear that in the game, in this very tough game for professorship, that I wasn't set in a winning position. So, and realizing that and saying, with, you tried with all your might, but Ooh, the only thing basically I could see in self-preservation, you didn't know when you started what to look for and you maneuvered you in a bad spot. But let's be honest, the, the biggest drawback on my side was actually my lack of writing skills. I wasn't that good in writing papers. So if I would have been fluent and, you know, and good in writing, then I would have maybe even made it from the position where I was, wasn't impossible. So there, yeah, there were a factor of circumstances, but there was a factor of me. So only embrace it. Hey, I feel. Um, now back to that point where I said, when do I overcome it? Once I was the expert and was out there and going from EEG lab to EEG lab and making people feel, what is the professor doing? A professor is one of those giants on which shoulders the next generation is standing, which brings the field forward and has this positive impact. Once I was this EEG expert and I was going to lab, from lab to lab and was helping people to achieve whatever they wanted to achieve, uh, achieve I had exactly that input, uh, or impact, input, impact on bringing the field forward actually much more so than any professor in their work group would have because I could go from group to group and help the people to do their EEG research in a very successful fashion. So overcoming it, I think it was... I was back on track, but differently than I originally thought. And obviously, from my student perspective or PhD perspective, I couldn't see that this is what I would be achieving. But once I achieved it, I was, I was obviously happy. But until then, I was, you know, it's not bad. Once in a while in life, that's failure. Yeah. That's okay. You would have to ask somebody else for the cool strategies to cope with failure. I just felt it was just painful. Yeah, yeah, but what I uh, noticed that you just changed your point of view so that there are 
different ways to achieve the same goal, like bringing the field forward, um, thinking about it more globally. Yes, it can be through professorship, but it can be also through your work coming and helping so many labs. Yeah. Yes, okay. I know he's controversial and if I'm saying that now, but I like the perspective of an Elon Musk. Go out there and fix it. You think electrical cars should be a thing? Um, don't build it. Just do it. Um, I think this is a perspective that is very helpful. You want to make the world a better place than the one. Oh, ask yourself, if I, if I would be in academia and I could do it again, I would ask myself and it would make it a lot easier on me. I would maybe go a different way. I would ask myself, why are you doing that? What do you want to achieve? And okay, this pathway, you're not set in a good way to do it from where you are, then, but what's your end goal? Know where you're going. This is one thing that I tell people frequently. If you don't know where you're going, don't be surprised if you don't get there. So if you know where you're going, there's maybe very different pathways to get there. But back then, in all honesty, I didn't have this foresight and I didn't definitely didn't have this engineering or, or entrepreneurial spirit that an Elon Musk had to just go out and fix it. But nowadays, I think if I could give the advice to somebody at the university and saying, I find I want to make the world a better place in this way or that way, or I want to gain this freedom that a professor has. This is one of the very attractive things. I want to get this reputation status impact that a professor has. Figure out which it is. And two yeah, very different ways. I work here with some the AI startup campus is 400 meters down the road. Code University is basically across on the other side of Berlin. Mitte. There are other places here where you can work with people, young people that start up and do something that likely has the same impact, maybe has may have more impact than uh, a professorship will have. Even so, I think a professor has huge impact by influencing all those minds of people and educating them and giving a powerful tool. So it's a multiplier position, but there's multipliers. And then there are people that actually do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can achieve that multiple ways. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree with that. And a little bit more expanding on this, again, different goals that people have. Uh, let's say people, for some reason, cannot pursue their path in a uh, academia, or maybe they didn't finish their PhD for some reason. Uh, they have master's and uh, PhD, maybe three, four years of PhD, and then some industry experience. They have certain ideas that they want to implement. They want to improve outcomes uh, in people with uh, neurological disorders. They have ideas. They want to pursue them. And uh, one of the opportunities uh, not in academia, because they cannot do academia, is uh, to create their own startup. Yes, you mentioned the startup. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that, because the number of startups, I think, is growing. Yes, people are trying <laughs> to do different things. Uh, what are the most maybe common mistakes do you see in uh, uh, neurotech startup industry? Yeah. Three, okay. Mm -hmm. Three. The first one is people underestimate what it means a medical device. Um, it's not that they don't have good ideas. It's not that they have fantastic science behind. It's not, you know, going out there and saying, hey, I have an idea how we could fix, diagnose, whatever, and then come up with problem A or somewhere between human well-being and actually a medical device and fixing a disease. And then they say, all this engineering, you can solve that as circuitry and it does a fantastic job. Uh, or psychologists say, we figured out an effect and we have a device that should be easy to fix. And then the big bummer is to figure out that the medical, that the moment you make any medical claim, you have to go through all of that regulatory work. And this regulatory work is <laughs> I'm saying it on a recording here. It feels like it's lobbied by big companies. It's not just the safety. I gave a talk um, a month ago about ethical of implantable BCIs. And I'm very vocal about 
that we're going the wrong direction. We are making it very hard to make research and spin off out of research into the clinical sphere. And that prevents exactly the type of medicine or devices that we need the most. The $3 million scanner from the hundred million of on the billion dollar company, what's not impacted? They hire three people that does do the regulatory work. The university spin-off that would build a three hundred dollar FNS device that you then could deploy in less fortunate countries to help where you have one doctor for fifty thousand patients. Those devices, those devices will not happen if we keep on regulating it down and build our luxurious medicine here. We do need to give a pathway to those companies. So I'm now flipping it around for the people that want to make a company. Be aware, the current space, Europe in particular, US is not that good. Um, other markets are somewhat better. It's very hard to come up with anything in the medical space here. A uh, friend of mine had the company, nine people, and they closed because the regulations are harder and harder, despite having good product and you know financially viable plan. At one point, that's the difficult part and the biggest part, in my opinion. Which means right at the get-go, if you want to get out with a clinical device, you need investors and substantially so. So which puts the bar higher, there's this value of that, and you have to get across that. But I do still encourage it. You know, if you're not working on your dream, you get hired by somebody else to work on their dream. I'm, I'm an employee, right? So I'm working on somebody else's big dream. I can stand fully behind the dream, but let's be honest. Right? So startup, if you're outside the medical space and you're clear that you're outside the medical space, there's enough to do. There are successful examples of companies that have built really cool devices somewhere in the neurotech space. I'm a big fan of what Ariel Gardner did with Muse. Um, there's some other ones, kind of a meditation app, and I usually have fun flying around on my desk because I'm using it. But, so I think there are other companies that could be founded. They should say yes, so you can be outside. Medical devices are hard. Uh, still, fun to yeah, I highly encourage this. The last mistake that I find in uh, startups is people should be focusing on what they're really good at. And what I find frequently in the market, they want to build a whole thing instead of being specific. So when I find people being successful, they do what they're really good at and they integrate everything they don't need to do themselves. This is much more successful than trying, let's say you come up with a little gimmick device and you think this device fixes whatever, some medical conditions or, or, or a wellness app. Here a wellness app on a little device. You can get into electronics design, uh, validation of that thing, manufacturing, Housing, building, you know, or, or, or biocompatibility, regulatory, distribution, marketing, and so on and so forth. Or you can say, I'm really good at this. And now I'm finding a company that builds the device for me. I find a company that does the marketing for me, whatever. And figure out what you're really good at and focus on that. When the people ask what I am doing, I describe myself as I'm really good at solving the complex integration problem. I'm more a matchmaker then I'm doing anything myself. I'm getting really good engineer and a really good manufacturing company and a really good distribution company and I get them all together and that provides a solution. And I think a lot of people in startups think they have to do the full stretch and haphazardly build all those pieces. That's not really good. And it's very hard to compete against other companies that do it by integrating. That was a long answer. Yeah, no, that that was perfect um, uh, to uh, to help people avoid certain mistakes. So thank you very much for that. And about the focus, it reminded me of the company that that you are leading at the moment, Nyx. Many of the companies in general, they are not as focused. So they provide EEG solutions, fMRI solutions, uh, whatever. People may need, they try to cater, um, you know, everything. However, you are focusing just on one modality. 
yes, um, FNIRS. Um, why do you think this advantages? What did you make that decision to focus only on providing this one solution, one product? So first, uh, NIREX GmbH, yeah, in Berlin that I'm responsible for is part of a group. Um, there is some holding somewhere in New York and has another we have sister company in the US, NIREX LLC. NIREX LLC is a distribution company and a distribution company likes to be something like a one-stop shop. And distributors have, I think you made an interview with Lloyd, for example, he is selling products from, from other companies, not, not his own products, but just says, I'm putting some together and whatever the people come, I'm, I'm, I'm a shop. So if you go to a supermarket, the supermarket is uh, having lots of different vendors' products and puts them all in one place. So you only have to go to one place. That's a distribution company. Marex LLC is a distribution company and you could mostly get SMS from them, but you could get other stuff from them as well. Um, as a manufacturer, what made Nirex successful, and I, I know it's always difficult to quantify, but you know, one of my things on my desk, our graphs, how successful our customers are. So we believe that we're the market leader, at least our customers are the most productive, as I said before. Um, how to get there, that was a strategy of Chris Randall and Richard, that were the leadership team before. Um, Chris was the engineer that built uh, the tech and um, Randall is the professor owner from New York and owner of the company. He came up with this FMS idea I would say 30 years ago. He, <laughs> he lives somewhere in the future and invents new tech at the moment. And then it was Richard, our US CEO, who is really driving our sales force up. No, 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 driving hard sounds. No, but he was really customer focused on getting the stuff out there. So three people working together to make the company successful. Everything else must have, have really, really, really good technology and then get it out to the customers and support those customers well. That got us fairly far. But once you're market leader, everyone looks at you and you have companies that are imitating you and copying from you. So it, it's much harder to innovate than to copy. And to stay ahead, you could keep on building just the best FNS device. And we hope we are doing that. But, yeah. but you have to provide uh, more and more of a full platform and a solution. So what we do is we integrate them with experimental software. So now we have an integration with ePrime, that's software that people can use to program the experiments. And we integrate with them. And on the back end, we integrate with the analysis software where you have Satori, which I believe is the first and currently still the only commercial um, FNS are most likely not only, but it's the only one I know of commercial analysis software. And then you expand that further and you integrate with other devices. You add physiology and, and some other, they call it short channels and little things that make it more and more of a complete solution that's easy to use and powerful and blah, blah, blah. So it's, if you say we are providing only FNS, it's not one box. This box makes really good FMS, but it is thinking what the people are doing and trying to provide them however their work evolves, which by the way is very hard because you basically have to start building it now for what they want to have in two years. So I need to be crystal ball and always kind of looking what do those highly creative people try to do in two years. So I would say we're don't really stick with one, which is this is our core competent as the manufacturer. And you can't, and before I just said, you can't do everything yourself, figure out what you're really good at and then do that. And this advice is still true for us. Yeah. And uh, about that crystal ball, actually, how do you envision what, what people may need in the future and uh, uh, starting already working on that beforehand? How do you do this? Okay, I, I show it once. That is Nair's philosophy brochure. So, a Nair's philosophy brochure, okay. Yeah, so it's written in there, but how we do it and what happened. So the sentence what's in there, we look for technical opportunity, scientific development, and integrate that into high-performing solutions. This is how we view it. 
the magic sauce is obviously um, not described in one sentence, but it's a good starting point. We are going out there and looking what are researchers doing right now. Um, what is the exciting, the, the leading things? There's a publication coming out, having a new idea. And they say, okay, this is what scientists want to do. Or where are they going? Then we are looking at technical opportunities. They can develop a new detector, a new light source, a new processor, a new whatnot. And then we say, oh, do we need to integrate that? Would that give us an advantage? So technology that doesn't exist is irrelevant. So we look at the technology, the upcoming technology, and then you go to those companies that built those detectors and you say, Hamamatsu in our field. And you say, hey, what's the next thing that's coming up? And they say, oh, we're working on X. And then you think, hmm, how would I have to build a device to capitalize on this feature of X? So you bring the technical developments, which drives what you could potentially build. You get the input from the scientists, what they want to do, where they are going. And obviously, you're listening to the NIH, where yeah, obviously <laughs> they are giving the money, they're putting the challenge out there. And if they're telling that, Next year will be, we want to get stroke solved or we want to get epilepsy solved or we're going to get this solved. Then you go to a stroke researcher and says, so tell me, what are you doing? How are you doing that? What is the challenge? And then you think, hmm, can we with all this technology and everything coming together can we help? So while I say crystal ball is actually a lot of pretty hard work and we monitor the grants, we monitor grant success, we monitor how much money is going where. Should have said that. You know why I started in FNES, why I switched to an FNES company? Personal circumstances and finding a job in Germany. I was commuting for a year. Yes. But also, I looked at which grants had which success rate. And then I looked, if just people apply for, irrespective of topic, to buy this technology or this technology or this, you know, another technology, how likely is that they're winning their grants? And some technology back then was something like 12%. Uh, success rate, just technology based, everything else ignored. And FNES was about 18%. So if you were just asking for a grant, including FNES, you had a higher chance of winning. And I said, okay, if NIH or whoever or the reviewers actually seem to be positively swayed of people doing something new, or maybe it's not that, maybe it's just there's more utility or there's something more new or whatever arguments were without, let's say, blind to the reason why it was happening. If you want to be successful, yes, you can't ignore the numbers. You have to look where the money is going. And yeah, that was for me a very big uh, confidence boost. And still at the moment uh, that Hefnius gets, I would nearly say, an unfair share of growth. Well, maybe it's a fair share of growth, but you no, know, going to, for now, you would say it's going in the right direction. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, one more question that uh, many of our uh, listeners are asking uh, quite a few. Uh, how relevant is PhD for work in industry? As I understand, for you, it was important to finish your PhD, although you already worked, uh, yes, in industry, you still were determined to finish. Why was that important for you personally? And what, how important it is right now, you think, for people trying to join industry? Finishing my PhD made no more difference for my career development, if you will. This was really this feeling of, I wanted to finish that because it was driving me for a long, long time in my life that I wanted to have a PhD. Um, not rationally, that was emotional. So I had to finish that. And there were three years of time invested, which would have felt lost. But again, I don't think it was a big difference for me. In general, academic, how does academic education translate into the business world? And I would say outside the more business related field, there are some fields where a PhD is still giving you plus points, even if it's outside your discipline, let's say in, in they say in those consultant companies, Boston Consulting or whatever, if you have PhD um, masters, it's good if you have a PhD in, not to say, a physics masters is good. If you have a physics PhD, you get paid more. So they value that, right? And then there are other disciplines where whether or not the doctor is not paid that much more, but a doctor is always a sign of, or a PhD is a sign that you 
have proven that you're a self-starter and to, to work on a hard problem and so on, you know how to how to solve harder problems. So I do think most places industry value it, but whether it's worth three years of work experience or whether worth three years of work experience pay you more, there's a question whether it fits. And actually the more interesting question I find is how much do I get for postdoc? And the longer you stick with the postdoc, the harder it gets. If your postdoc is exactly in line with the job requirement, it counts as good as you worked in the job. It's job experience straightforward, even, even with a tiny plus. If you happen to have learned in machine learning or in, in AI for the last 15 years, yes, those 15 years will be at the moment paid by any company as 15 years of most relevant job experience. If you have done a PhD in animal physiology and then continued in cellular biology, and you apply here, all your postdoc would have no value to us. So a postdoc is only creating value if it's really a well match with what the company is asking. And that is given how specialized postdocs are a very unlikely scenario. Sometimes you have a good match and then it's well paid. But you know, I think, yes. So the short answer is if it's a match, then it's paid for. A PhD has a general value, and then if it matches, and anything beyond that has actually only value, matches, roughly speaking. And what would you consider the equivalent of PhD? Like we, uh, we talked a little bit at the beginning about that match. Uh, for example, if uh, the requirement of the position is PhD and the person doesn't have PhD, what would you consider a match for that? Well, if you do a PhD, typically so here in Germany, you have proven that you wrote three papers and got them published now. If you don't have a PhD, but you have happened to have published three papers, then you could easily write them, well, I didn't, you know, three first authorships, you don't have to have a PhD. You write them, yeah, didn't do the PhD, wasn't funded or whatever, whatever reason you had. But hey, I did the work. I'm a self-starter. I have done with scientific work. I have published my papers. There would be no question. You would have to have a very blind HR person to not see that we are having actually somebody who is really skilled to come with such a profile. Um, a job experience, if they say they want to have a PhD, you don't have a PhD, but you work three, four years in very well matching job, it's three, four years working on the topic would in most cases likely be also a good fit. If you have a bachelor's only and you apply for a position where they say PhD preferred, Given that I recommended at the beginning that you put quite some effort in writing your application, I think that's not worth it. Even if you have a bachelor and quite some work experience, because the nature of making a PhD and the people that are willing to subject themselves to that hardship, I think it's different. But again, I'm speaking now from my perspective and other people see that differently. So don't take my word here as rules. Common sense, please. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, because some people are not hesitant actually to apply for positions because they think that that automatic detection of the requirement will just reject their application. So uh, what, what you are saying, uh, you are still reviewing applications manually or how does it work? But that would be the classical place where you can be smart. When you then write an email to somebody who seems to match or wherever you get the, the proximity, wherever you can engineer proximity to, do good writing style, give them an outline and then the details. Don't write a five page email. Hey, I'm highly motivated to join your company, but I am concerned because I don't have a PhD. However, I have worked there, have done this, have this experience and know all of this. And hence, while I consider that close to a PhD, I wouldn't want to bother your HR department if that gets sorted out. Do you think I shall apply or do you have any tips? If you could find 10 minutes for a personal talk, I would be so grateful. Chances that you get a positive answer from something like that, well-written, well-considered, very, very high. Seth, we are, it seems to be a very nice industry. 
And then they can tell you, no, listen, this position is really, they have already 80 applications and there are professors applying for that position. Not kidding, we also have former professors working here. Um, then save you time. But in most cases, I think just the one thing that we're not talking about so far, but companies try, there's no labor shortage. Companies try to find somebody that is loving the job because this person is doing it for less money and staying longer than a person that doesn't love the job. And if you show from the get-go that, oh, that is a dream job and a dream company and a dream location, I think hmm, this person, even at the lower end of the salary, will be here, will be happy. Or at the end of the salary, maybe they don't have a salary. They have a fixed salary bracket. Oh, at that salary, this person is most likely staying here, being motivated, happy to be here and staying along with us. Cool. So you come in with a big plus if you show that you have this high motivation and you care and you go to that effort to ask. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so many wonderful advice that you gave today. Uh, Patrick, what is the best way for our um, listeners to learn about uh, what your company does, about your products, and also the best way to get in touch with you? If you're a neuroscientist and you want to figure out what Nyrex is doing, or let's say FNUS in general, um, well, it, hopefully we are at the next conference. Stop by the booth, ask for in-person demonstration. There is just nothing, you know, seeing is believing, touching it, seeing it, and see. FNUS is a wonderful technology also from the sense that you can do really easy experiments where you put on the cap and you do uh, maze navigation or finger tapping to make the very easiest one and you, you can see in, in real time how brain activation is changing so it's a good technology for seeing us believing and stop by and look at it being in touch with me I use LinkedIn a lot uh, no being in touch with the company consulting at uh nilks.net. That is the address to write to. We work in teams. There's a team of smart people, I think 12 scientists or so. No, most likely more. Should know. <laughs> anyway, so there's a lot of smart scientists and you write them with a question and you will figure that's the nice people I'm talking about that are happy to help and provide more information. Okay, that's being in touch with the company. Hmm. Being in touch with me, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm at conferences. Uh, I was just at the SFN. I will go to the OHBM. I think that's my next one in Seoul. So I think that's a really nice one. Of course, I'm I'm on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect to people on LinkedIn. And if not, uh, you know, 101 way to reach out to Nairos, reach out to me. Thank you so much. And as we are nearing the end of our podcast, is there anything you would like to share to our listeners, provide any advice? Uh, anything you think would be uh, good to end our podcast. Thank you. Big advice to people that have studied in neuroscience. You underestimate how good you are. There are other disciplines that are so much better in telling their students that they are amazing once they're trained. They come out of university and think medical doctors. They have learned something. They know something. They are now saving lives personally hands-on and they're trained in engineers they can build devices they, they, they feel it's more like they can do something and hence they also are encouraged to think about themselves as these highly skilled people and i feel like in neuroscience you have learned something you know how to measure human beings accurately predict them work in big numbers, understand and deploy statistics. You have learned a ton of methods. You have learned how to read up on stuff and understand things from scratch. You have superpowers and you will only realize that slowly if you are then pitched against, not pitched again, you are in a meeting with other average models in your new company that you find. You will learn that you have learned something really, really cool and have a superpower. So at the moment, you're underestimating how smart you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I wish you from me and... Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> I enjoyed every second. Yeah, thank you. And uh, best regards and wishes from me and all our listeners um, um, uh, and to you, to your company, many new amazing developments and all possible success. So thank you. Thank you so much. 
Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, thank you for joining us on this incredible journey into the entrepreneurial world of neuroscience and neurotechnologies. I hope you've been inspired by the stories of those who are turning groundbreaking ideas into impactful realities. If you are looking for more guidance on succeeding in your careers, book a free consultation with me, your podcast host, Dr. K, at the Institute of Neuro Approaches. So, what are you waiting for? Let's navigate the path to success in the world of neuro careers and make the impossible possible together. <music>